And joining me right now on Tuesday Cafe is Hillsborough County Supervisor of Elections, Craig Latimer. Welcome back to Tuesday Cafe, Craig. Thank you. Good to see you. Yeah, nice to see you. I'm really glad you could join us. I know it's a very busy day for you, but we're going to hopefully give out as much information as we can. Um, I just read the update as of 923 this morning that 38,759 people had voted, had cast ballots just today in Hillsborough. What do we know about things like the turnout so far and whether there have been any issues at polling sites? Yeah, so that's a good number you just gave out, but I'll update you and tell you that at 10 a.m. this morning, we had voted uh, over 47,400 people. Uh, the turnout's been spectacular. Uh, right now, we're sitting at uh, just under 66% total turnout. Uh, we had huge uh, early vote, over 323,000 people, which is the most we've ever had in Hillsborough County uh, take advantage of early voting. And then we've had, of course, another uh, more than 193,000 that have voted by mail, and we're still getting vote by mail ballots returned to our five offices today. Uh, so, it, you know, we're looking at a really robust turnout here, and uh, I think people are really engaged. And what about crowds of people waiting times and if there's been any issues? Yeah, we haven't had any issues. That's first and foremost. Uh, we do have, did have lines first thing this morning, which is not unusual. Uh, the first hour this morning, we voted over 18,500 people uh, at our 240 locations around the county. Uh, so that's a pretty big number. So yeah, there were some lines that are moving quickly though. Uh, I haven't had any reports of uh, any excessive lines uh, that, aren't, that aren't going anywhere. Were there any changes to voting due to the hurricanes in Hillsborough County? Yes, we had to relocate uh, one early vote site, uh, which we did. And then we've had to relocate seven election day sites. And uh, those sites, the people that voted those sites, we've sent postcards to. And there's also signs marking those sites that they're not a polling site and where to go to if somebody was to go to the old site. Now, if someone still has their vote by mail ballot, there, there are a couple of options, but they don't have as many options as they might have had a couple of weeks ago. What, would, what advice would you give someone who has a vote by mail ballot? Right. If you have a vote by mail ballot and you want to vote by mail and turn that in, you have to turn it into one of my five offices before 7 p.m. tonight. Uh, what you can do, you, you, you can take it to an election day site, but not turn it in there. You can surrender that ballot there and vote in person if you want to do that. So if you're closer to your polling site than you are to one of my offices, uh, you can take advantage of just surrendering that vote by mail ballot. You cannot leave a vote by mail ballot at an election day site. They don't have any way to get it back to my office by seven. And I just want to clarify that uh, you can't leave it there as a vote, but you can you Correct. can surrender it as is the word or even spoil it is, is another word that I've heard elections people use. You can turn it over to the the um, the worker and they'll give you a brand new ballot on which to vote in person that day today that is correct yes they'll they'll you surrender your vote by mail ballot uh even if you've already voted it they're gonna make it uh you know spoiled so so it can't go through the machine and request a, a ballot right then and they'll give you a ballot issue you a ballot and you can vote put it in the machine yourself if you're not sure where to vote today what's the best way to find out uh, two ways. You can go to our website, votehillsburg.gov, look yourself up. It should tell you where your polling site is. Uh, if you don't have access to the internet or you're having any trouble with it, call our office at 813-744-5900. And you have to vote at your polling location today unless you go to the Supervisor of Elections office. Uh, no, you have to vote in your polling station today. You have to vote in the polling site that's attached to your precinct. Uh, my offices are not polling sites right. on election day. Sorry, I misspoke there. And um, what about, is there still a way for people to see a test ballot, a, a mock ballot that so they can prepare ahead of time and, and know who they're going to vote for and what types of issues they're going to vote for? Right. And that's be a sample ballot. Uh, we've mailed sample ballots out to people that didn't get a vote by mail ballot, but you can go on my website, votehillsburg.gov again, and you can pull up your specific sample ballot. What are the rules for waiting in line in Election Day? And I'm maybe thinking about if someone is going to show up close to seven tonight, or what about um, things like interactions with people who aren't voting, um, either either reporters or, or um, uh, canvassers or something while you're in line? All right, let's, let's back up a minute and say that, first off, if you're in line at 7 p.m., 
uh, you're going to be able to vote. At 7 p.m., a poll worker will come and stand at the end of that line at that point, and everybody in front of that poll worker is going to be able to vote. Uh, in Florida, we also have what's called a 150-foot no solicitation zone, uh, where uh, campaigners should not be interacting with voters in any way, shape, or form. Uh, now, as far as reporters go, uh, reporters are allowed in that 150-foot no solicitation zone because they're just reporting. They're not trying to campaign for anybody. But what we ask the reporters to do is to not engage with any voters until they're on their way out of the polling site. What can people, what should pre people bring to the polls, that is? Well, the first thing is you have to bring one of the acceptable forms of identification. There's about 12 of them. Again, you can go to my website, look those up. The easiest one is a driver's license or a Florida ID card. Uh, there's also a passport, government issued identification, things like that. Uh, but more importantly, if you get to the polling site and you realize you don't have your identification with you, request to vote a provisional ballot. Uh, what you do is you vote a regular ballot and it goes into a provisional envelope and you have to sign that envelope and fill out information on it. When we get that back to our office, we're going to compare the signature on that envelope to the signature we have on file for that voter. And if that matches, they don't have to do anything else. If it doesn't match, we're going to try and reach out to them. And they've got till two days after the election to remedy that. What if you are given a provisional ballot because they couldn't find you on the rolls and they, it's simply because you were in the wrong precinct? What what happens then? Yeah. So if you are in the wrong precinct, if we, we find you, number one, and tell you you're not in the right precinct, you need to go to your correct precinct and a voter chooses not to do that and insists on voting a provisional ballot, they can do that. And I can tell you right now, it's going to get rejected by the canvassing board because the law is very specific that you have to vote and the polling site attached to your precinct on election day. Now we do get situations where they can't find somebody in the in our voter files. And oftentimes it's because they have a hyphenated name or maybe they've, they've changed their name and didn't update it with our office. Uh, and they will give, be given an opportunity and, and the voter should ask to vote a provisional ballot. When we get that back here, our staff can do a little bit deeper dive into it in the voter files to ascertain if in fact that is a registered voter and if they are voting at the correct uh, place, a uh, polling site, and then that would be recommended to the canvassing board to accept that. Um, you know, the other thing that we see a lot of is people that registered after the 29 days book closing. You know, you have to be registered 29 days before the election. Uh, so they've got a voter information card in their hand, but they didn't register in time. So they're not eligible for this election. What about voters who have moved within the state but have not updated their address prior to Election Day? You can update your address up to and including Election Day at the polls. So, you know, if you know, you know, if you've moved to the area, uh, ask your neighbor where the polling place is, or you can put your address into the street finder. It'll tell you where the polling place is, and then you can update your address at the polling site. I want to remind people that we're talking with Craig Latimer, the Hillsborough County Supervisor of Elections. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting live from the studios of WMNF Tampa on Election Day, November 5th. And uh, um, we've heard in this election and in previous elections that there might be harassment of poll workers. Are you prepared in, in the case that that happens? We haven't seen that at all, uh, Sean, to be truthful with you. I think we're just very fortunate in our area here. We've got, you know, I, I talk about elections are um, put on by the community for the community. You know, our poll workers live and work in this in this county, in this community, and they're out there to put on an election for their neighbors, uh, friends, you know, sometimes family. Uh, so, you know, that's the type of event that we're having here. And uh, fortunately, we're not seeing any harassment of any of our great poll workers. And we've got over 2,500 of them out there that we've trained and are out working today. I want to ask you for your reaction about this AP story that I saw yesterday. Some Republican-led states say they will block the Justice Department's elections monitors from going inside polling places on Election Day. They're pushing back on federal authorities' decades-long practice of watching for violations of federal voting laws. Officials in Florida and Texas have said they will not allow Justice Department election monitors into polling sites. That seems like a big change. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, that's not a change at all, Sean, to be truthful with you. The okay. statute's very, very specific about who is allowed in a polling site on election day. And uh, the Justice Department is not one of the entities allowed in a polling site on election day in Florida. 
All right. I appreciate you uh, clearing that up for us. Uh, thanks so much. The last thing I want to ask you before I let you go, Craig Latimer, is about people who need assistance getting to the polls. What is the partnership between Hart and the Hillsborough Supervisor of Elections? Yeah, so we, we don't have a partnership with them. They do this on their own. Uh, and they do offer uh, rides to the polls. You have to show your voter information card uh, with the address on it. Uh, I also saw something that was put out, too, where apparently uh, Lyft is given a 50 percent off uh, to get to the polls. And there's codes to put in. So I'm not familiar with what the codes are or anything, but I'm sure somebody could Google that and, and figure that out. Uh, so, yes, there's availability. You know, and one of the things that we certainly try and do is uh, we look at our polling sites in areas that we know there may be transportation issues, we're going to make those uh, smaller precincts so they're easily accessible by the neighborhood. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Is there anything else that people should know about voting is in, on Election Day in Hillsborough County? This is the last day to vote. If you haven't voted yet, get out and vote. You've got till 7 p.m. tonight. And I would urge people to go out. Remember, your vote is your voice. So let's let's have your voice heard. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on Tuesday Cafe, Craig. Thank you, Sean. Good to talk to you as always. Nice to talk to you. Hillsborough County Supervisor of Elections, Craig Latimer, is joining us on Tuesday Cafe. Thanks very much. Well, don't forget, later on in the show, we're going to hear from McKenna Schuler, a staff reporter for Orlando Weekly. But we return now to uh, another subject. We're going to find out the latest about prisoner Leonard Peltier. He was convicted of first degree murder in the deaths of two FBI agents in a 1975 shooting on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. He's being held at the United States Penitentiary in Coleman, north of Tampa, and many people think he was wrongly convicted and consider him to be a political prisoner. And we're joined by our next guest right now. Gene Roach is president of the ILPDC board. That's the International Leonard Peltier Defense Committee. Welcome to Tuesday Cafe, Gene. Yeah. How are you? How's everybody? I'm good. Thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. We're going to uh, kind of update people on this case that has been going on for decades now, and it may be a special interest to people in this area because uh, right in our area is this Coleman Penitentiary, which is where Leonard Peltier is. Last Thursday, the free Leonard Peltier Now Twitter account posted that Peltier was released from the hospital and he still needs medical care. So what can you tell us about the health of Leonard Peltier? Well, um, Leonard's been sick for a while and he continues to get worse every day um, when he had COVID, uh, when he was inside Coleman, he was denied proper care, one, including basic drinking water. And um, everyone knows that Coleman has a bad uh, water problem. So I just feel that his, his continued decline due to diabetes and his other heart issues can be avoided, you know, with the proper care. And one is real basic is exercise. And when they're on 24 hour lockdown, you don't get that. And, you know, a lot of the other prisoners suffered the same fate. So what we need to do is, um, you know, basically get the, um, the, the basic human rights thing, the human rights um, issues, you know, just brought to the real basic levels of, hey, we're human, he's human. Everybody there is human, and they deserve the basic health care and water, for one. So Leonard, right now, he's going for executive clemency, and he's been for a long time. Um, there's been so many people that have been released, you know, people that have shot at presidents and stuff like that, and they've been released. Now, Leonard Peltier um, has been in there for almost 50 years. And there was no credible evidence that his initial trial was a railroad. So everybody knows the case. There's so many um, uh, violations all the way down from basic human rights, constitutional, federal, even international laws are broken to keep Leonard or get him into the prison. And with all that, they still continued their vendetta. The FBI is the one reason why he's in there. And they're not allowed on our reservations in the very beginning. They should never have been there. And the reason why they came to Oglala in 1975 was looking for somebody that stole somebody's cowboy boots. What is that? Now, that's a, just a, um, 
a manufactured light to have a reason to be there because illegal they were there illegal. We have an 1868 treaty which states has rules on that. And they continued to ignore or please for Leonard to be released as an elder. His co-defendants were acquitted on the basis of self-defense. That would be the same thing for him. And anybody was there at that camp. It didn't really matter what and who did what. The bottom line is we have a right to defend or freedom. And they defended us as children. Saved our lives. So he should not be in prison. In an email, you described him yourself as a survivor of the 1975 Ogala shoot, shootout where Leonard, and you say Leonard protected us. So what do you mean by that? There was a, the, the, where they had attacked the FBI was a home of the grandma and grandpa. And there were several houses in the area, like a ranch and mostly women and children. And we were happy that the grandma and grandpa were not there that day because their house got hundreds of bullet holes in it. It was an old log cabin. It was totally ruined. And, you know, they didn't come with a warrant. The whole climate of the reservation was real irritable considering when did happen a couple of years before. So uh, there was a price tag on American Indian movement leaders. You know, anybody that participated or even um, were friends with AIM people were targets by the, then it was the corrupt, corrupt government run by the BIA, which you have a tribal president named Wilson who made targets of everybody. And Leonard was one of the targets as a leader. The reason why a lot of this has happened to him. And we've had several different um, violations by the FBI trying to change the story, trying to cover their tracks. And we have documents on, on several issues that they try to twist and make it look like Leonard's the bad person, which in fact, he's not. He's a human person, you know. But of course, the stereotypes that we face are daily as Native people. And so you are asking people to contact the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee, and you want to see that the BOP gives Peltier an emergency medical transfer to FMC Rochester. So what is FMC Rochester? Why there? And what's the BOP and what role do they have in the next steps? Well, for one, uh, Rochester is a medical unit with skilled um, physicians. Uh, With the injury that had happened to him when he was in the hospital, it's typical of a diabetic patient. You know, they start needing, um, you know, they, they don't get the right exercise or the right food. And, you know, so much carbs and stuff like that and bad water, you know. So by transferring him out to a better facility will enable him to have better care or care at all. The way the facilities run, they don't give you the right care. They think everybody's lying or making it up, but he needs emergency help. And he's been for a long time. His eyesight is giving out. You know, he was a great artist, and now he doesn't have that satisfaction of painting a picture. I have one of them in the background that he painted. And, you know, it's a sad fact that the the United States government continues his vendetta. And the Native people see it as a reason why not to trust the United States government. If they can hold Peltier in there for 50 years, they'll never come to the table with good faith. They continue to keep him. That tells us that none of us are free until Leonard Peltier is free. Our and that's is, just the way it is. Our guest is Gene Roach, president of the ILPDC board. That's the International Leonard Peltier Defense Committee. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're speaking to uh, everyone live on November 5th, Election Day here. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And uh, you mentioned earlier executive clemency, that that other people have been uh, granted executive clemency, but in the nearly 50 years of this case, uh, that hasn't happened it's the closing days or months, that is, of the, the um, Biden presidency. What kind of, um, what kind of uh, talks have you had with the Biden administration and how does executive clemency look? Is that a possibility? I think anything's a possibility, but I'll tell you what, when it comes to Native people, we're never given fair treatment. And one of the reasons is because this is all stolen land. 
And one thing about the vendetta that the FBI holds against Peltier is they will have to admit to their lies and corruption. We're talking about 50 years, probably more before that. The intimidation, the infiltration, you know, that they did to the movements is definitely part of this story. So it's a bigger picture, and it, like I told you, it reflects on Indian country and how we perceive the United States government and them not being able to come to the table with good faith because they allow Leonard Paltier to be railroaded and suffering in prison as an elder. He did his time regardless. His co-defendants were acquitted on the basis of self-defense. Self-defense, that was found by a court. So there ain't no way the United States government was going to let him get away. Their vendetta was to have a scapegoat, and they continued to push it. Leonard needs to be free, and until he's free, who are we? And what is this United States government about? What's the Constitution? Real basic. The Constitution gives us rights. Why aren't we allowed to have it the same as everybody else? Well, Gene, uh, those are my questions. Excuse me, and so I just wanted to to see if there was anything else that I that I didn't get to ask that you want to let us know about the health or the condition or the possible executive clemency of Leonard Peltier, who's in Coleman Federal Prison, just north of Tampa. Yeah, so people would reach out to the president, anybody, uh, Congress. We have a lot of support of Congress already, but we need more people to let them aware that they need to. Uh, to follow their own rules, really, and let him be a free person. He only has a few years of his life left. He's never held his great-grandchildren, his children. You know, just a real basic hug is something that we take for granted that he doesn't get to have. He needs to heal. He needs to come back to his community. We have our own religion. He needs to be able to participate on a religious level inside the prison also. There's so many things that Leonard needs and at least meeting the need of him getting medical care is real basic. And executive clemency would be, you know, the right thing to do for President Biden. And we encourage that to be uh, be right, you know, stand up for what's right, not for the pu what the puppet strings say. Well, I want right? to thank you so much for joining us on Tuesday Cafe, Gene. Thank you. Well, thank you, Gene. Free out there. Yep, free out there. Gene Roach is president of the ILPDC board. That's the International Leonard Peltier Defense Committee. And this is Tuesday Cafe. And we turn now to our next guest, who is a familiar voice to the WMNF audience. Our guest is McKenna Schuler, who is a staff reporter with Orlando Weekly. She has a new article in Creative Loafing. The title of it is, is uh, we we were forced into it after union dissolution. University of South Florida privatizes 400 jobs. Welcome back to Tuesday Cafe, McKenna. Thank oh, sorry, I muted you by accident. I'm sorry. It's all good. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, thanks so much for coming back on. So what can you tell us about these 400 jobs that you are writing about in Creative Loafing? Yeah, so late last month, USF announced uh, they'd entered into an agreement with one of the nation's largest food service contractors, the Compass Group, which also services other public and private employers, including companies like Google. Um, and this means they will be replacing Aramark, another big contractor, as the university's food services management company. But it will also privatize the jobs of about 400 state employees in custodial, groundskeeping, and maintenance work. And I found this really significant because these are jobs that were formerly represented by a labor union, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, AFSCME. And so it was interesting because I, I had a worker reach out to me. I had no idea about this until somebody gave me a call. And this person was not happy, but they also didn't feel like they had a choice because for the first time in years, a significant decision affecting um, him and his coworkers' jobs and livelihood um, wasn't something to be negotiated or really discussed. They were just told of the change and told of the change 20 days after it had already been finalized between the two parties, USF and this contractor. And this wouldn't have been the case just a year ago. Because in January, the labor union that formerly represented these workers, um, these state employees, 
AFSME was decertified by the state. Um, and that left hundreds of non-instructional workers at the university, largely blue collar workers, without union representation or the benefits and protections previously afforded to them under a union contract. And that's a big change to go from having a state job, and we'll talk maybe about how the, the pension uh, situation uh, is impacted by this, a state job to then having not, no state job, but instead having a job with a contractor. What can you tell us about the important differences there? Yeah, so it's important to mention up top that the state workers have been offered the chance to stay on at USF, but um, as employees of the Compass Group, or it's one of its subsidiaries, specifically effective December 1st. So they were given basically a month's notice to either leave or decide to stay. But what comes with that is a lot of uncertainty at this point, from what I hear. Um, it, it there's not supposed to be a huge impact on wages necessarily, but healthcare will change. And I think the most important thing for, that I've heard from a couple of folks is uh, retirement. So these state employees had the opportunity after um, either six or eight years of working there to be able to um, qualify for a pension plan under the Florida retirement system. And that's just not going to happen anymore. So there are people who had that pension plan who they're no longer going to have USF contributing to that. And then there are workers that maybe stayed on long enough because they wanted to be able to qualify for a pension that are never going to receive that now, at least under this uh, new agreement with the Compass Group, which I believe is a 15 year contract. So the, the well, how did the union, as you were mentioning earlier, how is the dissolution of the union, what brought that about and how is that impacting the deal? Yeah, so we tried to kind of put this in the in the headline too, but this the, the decertification of the labor union was entirely tied to a new state law that was approved last year, um, SB 256, which was dubbed Paycheck Protection by its very enthusiastic cheerleader, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Um, as that kind of term, Paycheck Protection, it's not unique to DeSantis. It's been used in other states with other similar policies pushed by the same anti-union special interest groups. But what that law does is it prevents workers from voluntarily paying union dues um, to the union through an automatic payroll deduction, which has historically been just the most the easiest way to pay dues. And the law also requires at least 60 percent of employees that are represented by the, the union to be dues paying members in order for that union to remain certified, because under Florida's right to work law, becoming a dues paying member is um, entirely voluntary. But now with the paycheck deduction um, ban and other barriers that the law has put, in, put into place, it's been a lot harder for unions to grow their membership. And that union wasn't the only one to be decertified at USF. It was also the, the union that represented adjunct faculty. Yeah, so as a result of the law so far, um, more than 68,000 formerly unionized public employees in Florida have since lost their union representation and, again, by extension, their union contracts. And that includes all adjunct faculty unions that were um, certified in the state. So I think that was about eight adjunct faculty unions across the state have all been dissolved. And a lot of other em university employees too, mostly blue collar. So th the target of the law was widely perceived as the state's teachers unions, but so far not a single teachers union has been decertified. It's mostly been a lot of blue collar or white collar workers for city and county governments. Um, or for some police departments, some civilian employees like 911 dispatchers, because the law did carve out, um, make exemptions for police, firefighter and correctional officer unions. But that doesn't include civilian employees and police departments that also are really important in terms of public safety. Our guest is McKenna Schuler, a staff reporter with Orlando Weekly. She has an article in Creative Loafing Tampa. It's called, We Were Forced Into It After Union Dissolution, University of South Florida Privatizes 400 Jobs. 
We're speaking to her about that. And in a bit, we're going to turn to some election news, maybe out of Orlando. We'll, we'll learn more about what's happening in the Orlando area. We don't always get to hear that uh, here in the Tampa Bay area. But before we move on to election day news, McKenna, what else should we know about your article about the USF workers or any kind of labor issues? Yeah, so USF has pretty strongly messaged that they're trying to make this transition as easy as possible, at least in their official messaging for workers. Um, and it does appear that they went to the table with the Compass Group, the, the new contractor, to kind of figure out a way to make that transition easy for employees. Um, at the same time, the workers themselves were not invited to that table and they were told only after the fact. But USF does estimate that the transition from the state jobs to the privatized jobs um, and whatever comes along with that, because the details are still murky at this point, um, that transition will be worth nearly 320 million in cost savings, um, $320 million, I should say, in cost savings and additional revenue for USF over the life of the 15 year contract, which includes specifically $25 million in cost savings for the contractors, um, quote, enhanced facility operations. But it's unclear exactly where those cost savings will come, perhaps as it pertains specifically to these jobs that have been privatized. So there's a lot of concerns still about job security and, you know, maybe pay and benefits will generally stay similar to what they have been for a while. But how long and what comes after that? Will there be job cuts or other cuts to pay? The Compass Group does have um, subsidiaries, including um one specifically called Chartwells, which um, just reached a tentative agreement with Duval County Public Schools because they have food service workers there, um, jobs that were also privatized. But one of the concerns that workers there brought up was really low pay and they reached a deal, but it still is, um, you know, not the kind of job that you might necessarily be able to have if you're a public sector employee versus a private employee working for a pretty low wage contractor. Well, let's move on to what we know about election day in the Orlando area. What are you hearing in central Florida about amendment Four? people turning out to vote either way on that? What, what kind of mood is there there? Yeah. So I think my area specifically there, there, I think there is a lot of support for amendment Four. I mean, even just driving around, you know, I'll see the odd vote no on four, sign but there's been a lot of energy specifically like around the us or the ucf campus um and we also have state rep Anna escamani who i know has been a repeat guest on your show uh and she's been one of the most passionate uh politicians in the state i would say about amendment four really working hard with um other floridians protecting freedom yes on four campaign partners to get out the vote on Amendment 4. So I think there's a lot of energy around it over here in Orlando, but it, it's unclear to me kind of across the state what that's going to look like. I have the same question for you about Amendment 3, the proposal that would allow the recreational use of cannabis products in Florida. Uh, how is that looking in, in Orlando where you're reporting from? Yeah, so I will say, um, I, I mean, we, we do have uh, <laughs> the state's so-called pot daddy, John Morgan, here, and he's been very um, instrumental with the Yes on Three campaign in terms of getting out the vote and kind of, you know, trying to debunk some of the claims coming from the opposition about Amendment 3. Uh, I, I haven't seen as much kind of grassroots energy as far as canvassing and stuff for Amendment 3 over here, but I do think... Uh, you know, there's a lot that's been done by the campaign to try and bring in different stakeholders across party lines to uh, kind of explain the potential benefits that could come with uh, legalizing recreational marijuana for adults 21 and over. A really closely watched race is Senator Rick Scott is being challenged by Democrat Debbie Mukersell Powell. Um, there's, uh, you know, it's kind of a little bit under the radar when you think about the presidential race and then these amendments, but it's uh, if, you know, it's if it's close, if it's worth watching, it could really impact the U.S. Senate overall. Uh, what are you hearing about that race? So I don't I specifically don't have a lot of insight into that race. I will say that's not one of the ones I've been able to kind of uh, look into as closely. I've been focusing a lot more on kind of the more localized elections that we have going on in Orange County and the Orlando area. 
Yeah, and that's definitely my the next track I wanted to take. One of the big ones is the former uh, state prosecutor, the the state attorney there in Osceola and Orange Counties, Monique Worrell, was fired by Governor Ron DeSantis and replaced, similarly to what happened here in Hillsboro. So, what can you tell us about Monique Worrell and her opponent in in that race? Yeah, so I was about to say we kind of have that that sort of matching thing going on over in your area and my area, but in a in a very high stakes bid to return to elected office, uh, former state attorney Monique Worrell faces off against uh, current uh, state attorney Andrew Bain, who is a DeSantis appointee that the governor placed in office after suspending Worrell last August over allegations of basically neglect of duty and not being tough enough on crime. And of course, this came less than two years after DeSantis similarly similarly suspended Tampa area state attorney Andrew Warren. And it was broadly, I think, seen as politically motivated, like the case with Warren as well. And there was a comprehensive review by the Orlando Sentinel of some of the allegations made against Worrell that kind of found very little merit in those allegations. But Worrell is a Democrat and a former defense attorney, prosecutor, law professor, uh, she's backed by a lot of, you know, local Democrats, Ruth's List, as well as three former Florida Supreme Court justices. And she won her race for state attorney in 2020 with 66 percent of the vote and really kind of focused campaigning and during her time in office on preventative programs and measures to stop crime, um, to prevent it from happening in the first place and had campaigned on ending the school to prison pipeline, mass incarceration of people who commit petty crimes. And Bain, Andrew Bain is the DeSantis appointee. He officially is running as not party affiliated, but he's also been backed by the Republican party. And he's also been backed by the police unions, Orange County Sheriff John Mina, and a lot of local current or former Republican politicians. But it is going to be a very interesting race for us to watch to see whether Bain has sort of developed the relationships in his time in office to secure enough support to be for the first time elected to the position, or if Worrell will return to office. What's behind Andrew Bain running as an NPA, no party affiliation, as opposed to running as a Republican the way Susie Lopez is here in Hillsborough County? Yeah, so I think officially kind of on the record, he's just sort of trying to he he said he's trying to keep politics out of it and part, partisan politics out of the race. Um, th- there's been some sort of controversy over whether there was that was an intentional kind of move because there was a Republican who was running in in, in the primary, but then kind of, uh, I believe, dropped out ahead of the primary. So there's some different sort of factors going on behind the scenes that I don't have as much insight into. But I think Bain is hoping to be able to kind of uh, reach people across lines and and kind of keep partisan politics out of it. And in the conversations that we had before this show, you were telling me that one of the races to watch in that area for state house was this Gen Z progressive who's running for a Florida house seat. What can you tell us about Nate Douglas? Yeah, so Nate Douglas is a 23-year-old policy researcher and climate justice activist um, concerned about the climate crisis. He joined the Sunrise Movement when he was just 17 years old and ran a successful campaign for the elected position of a soil and water conservation district board member in Orange County in 2020 when he was just 19 years old. And he he didn't plan on seeking higher office, but he told me he felt motivated to run after Florida's red wave during the 2022 midterm election cycle and the fall of Roe v. Wade. He told me specifically he was studying abroad for a while, and then he came back to Florida, and the first call he got in the airport was from his sister who told him that uh, Roe v. Wade had been overturned, and that was kind of significant for him. And so I think climate justice activism is really, you know, important to him personally, but he's also been kind of, he's also running on a platform that includes addressing issues such as skyrocketing property insurance rates, unaffordable rents for for the, for the younger residents of his district, because it does, it is a, 
it is a very young district. I think the median age is like 29, and that's because it includes UCF. But it was also a district that following redistricting, it became redder. So it It is currently represented by Republican Susan Placencia, and she was elected to office. She took the seat that was former. It was formerly represented by uh, Democrat Carlos Guillermo Smith, who is now going to be returning to the state Senate, or he's going to be entering the state Senate, I should say. But Douglas has kind of made the argument that the reason that Placencia even won in 2022 was mostly because of a Republican um, advantage in terms of voter turnout. So I think he's really been focusing on trying to turn out the vote, especially among younger people in the UCF area. And how does that look? How does a, a Gen Z progressive who's running for a Florida state house seat represented by a Republican, uh, is that is are people uh, motivated by his age? Or um, is it, you know, I'm not I'm not sure how to how what the other options are but um it's kind of unique in florida necessarily to have somebody that young running um it's quite often people who have been in politics for a while that run for seats like this but what's the energy been like there yeah so i asked him pretty candidly if he was worried about his age or that kind of factoring into, into people's decisions and he says so far um you know at the doors and stuff it's not really an issue because of what matters more to people is Uh, his platform and what he hopes to address in office. And he told me specifically, like I asked him, you know, how, how realistic, like realistically, what do you think you can actually accomplish as a Democrat in a GOP con controlled state legislature right now? And he said he specifically wants to kind of focus on hopefully addressing property insurance concerns, um, skyrocketing rates and transit. So trying to bring in more state dollars for public transit in the Orange County area. You know, since you mentioned transit, uh, I don't know if you're prepared for a question like this, but um, the the Bright Line train has recently came to Orlando. There's talks about it extending to the Tampa area. Um, what are the people that you talk to? How do they feel about having this train that links to South Florida? Um, I, I think people are pretty excited. I've seen a lot of excitement around it, but I I, I haven't <laughs> looked into it too much myself. But I I think people are excited by the probably the ability to have more transit options, uh, specifically also if they can be, you know, pretty accessible and affordable. Well, our guest is McKenna Schuler, a staff reporter with Orlando Weekly. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and you're, you're listening on Tuesday on WMNF Tampa is where we're broadcasting. And we have about seven or eight minutes left. And I earlier in the show, McKenna and I had asked people to write in about their elections experience. So um, I, I can encourage people to call in and, and ask the question if you have any questions of McKenna or if you just want to tell us how your voting went. The number is 813-239-9663. You can text us at 813-433-0885 or you can email dj at wmnf.org. I'm going to read a couple of them now. Um, I, could, I could let you go, McKenna, if you're super busy right now, or if you'd like to, to hang on and see if anybody, if, if you want to participate in answering any of these questions that people have, that's completely up to you. Um, I can hang out for a few more minutes, then I have right. to get on some work, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, all right. Sounds great. Well, thanks so much. So Karen wrote in from Denise, and she says, I received my mail, my ballot in the mail, and then I drop it off. And she said that about 70 people were in line to early vote. Karen in Dunedin concludes her email with Go Blue. So thanks for that email out there, Karen. Uh, also, this is from Mary, and she says she went to the Pinellas County Courthouse yesterday to vote. All the political signs were across the street as usual, except she said that... Um, that DeSantis had signs to stop him amendment for on the courthouse grounds. And she's wondering how he got away with that, including using our tax money to run ads to fight this amendment while threatening others who choose to do the same. And this is Mary from Memphis. And she says, says that she is mistakenly seeking political asylum in DeSantis's Florida. She uses some, um, some slander, some mean words there, which I don't necessarily need to use, but you get the idea of where Mary's coming from. Um, uh, you know, that's, that brings me to, to McKenna to, to a question about this fight against amendment four and even amendment three by the government of Florida. We saw all sorts of, um, departments in Florida that were, that were, um, 
putting ads out against these amendments. And DeSantis on his pulpit would say almost every day would have a press conference uh, encouraging people to vote against this. Uh, in your newsroom, have, and has there been any discussion about the, the state actually getting involved in the election here? Yeah, so I've, I've sort of incorporated some of that into my reporting on this issue and Amendment 4. I know uh, there's there are other reporters across the state that have done really great reporting on just kind of tracking the government interference and the money that's behind it, because this is millions of dollars in taxpayer funds that the state is using to oppose uh, uh, constitutional amendments that should be decided by the voters in a very, you know, sort of democratic process without... I mean, so I think for critics specifically or, you know, proponents of Amendment 4, it's adding insult to injury in, in terms of just weaponizing state funds like this. But uh, yeah, it's 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 going to be interesting to see what sort of effect that does have. I know I've been seeing polling that shows less support for Amendment 4 over the past few months. And I do wonder if that's part of the state's um, interference, as well as different groups uh, that have sort of jumped in to oppose Amendment 4. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us on Tuesday Cafe, McKenna. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. And we'll have you back, I'm sure. McKenna Schuler is a staff reporter with Orlando Weekly, and her article in Creative Loafing Tampa is called We Were Forced Into It After Union Dissolution, University of South Florida Privatizes 400 Jobs.